Wow, so we have finally come to the last video in the series on introductory circuit modeling. I hope you've learned as much as I have. If I've not mentioned it before, no matter how many times you watch videos, even if they were the most awesome introduction to circuits videos in existence, I'm not referring to these videos, of course, you will not be able to do circuit analysis. At least not any more than you can learn to play guitar by watching a concert. Watching someone do something is not learning. You have to practice on your own. And actually, though it goes against the social makeup of an engineer, you will do better if your practice occurs with other people around that can help you through the tough spots or point out mistakes you might have missed. There is no substitute for practice under the supervision of a coach that knows what they are doing. In this last video, we are going to look at how we can apply phasers to basic circuit analysis. How basic, you might ask? Specifically, we are going to use voltage division and current division. Phasers apply to any sinusoidal steady state circuit, so we're not limited to these techniques, but we have to start somewhere. And voltage and current division should illustrate most of the principles we need to apply the tools we already have in our toolbox to circuits in the phaser domain. Let's start with a voltage division problem. I do not want to pick an entirely trivial problem, so let's start with a circuit that will require at least one additional step before we do voltage division. Here is a circuit containing a sinusoidal source, a resistor, capacitor, and a couple of inductors. Our goal will be to determine the time varying voltage across the 500 picofarad capacitor. We have one sinusoidal source in the circuit, so phasor analysis can be used to solve the circuit. The first step will be to take the circuit over to the phasor domain. The simplest quantity to convert is our variable, the time dependent voltage V of T. This becomes the phasor voltage V. The voltage source has a magnitude of 5 with an angular frequency of 5 million radians per second and no phase angle. Setting the angular frequency off to the side for use in future equations, we have the phasor voltage of 5 e to the j0 degrees volts. Resistance does not change when converted to the phasor domain, so that will remain 600 ohms. The impedance of an inductor is j times the angular frequency times the inductance, so we will get j 400 ohms for the top inductor. The impedance of a capacitor is 1 over j times the angular frequency times the capacitance, so we will get minus j 400 ohms for the impedance of the capacitor. The impedance of the right-hand inductor will be calculated the same way as the top one. In this case, the result will be J200 ohms. Now we have all our quantities for the circuit in the phasor domain. Any of the tools that applied to resistors can be used now. I already stated that the plan was to use voltage division, but the circuit does not have a voltage source in series with a bunch of components. To get it there, we will first have to combine the two parallel impedances on the right-hand side of the circuit. Parallel impedances add reciprocally, so the reciprocal of the equivalent impedance will be the sum of the reciprocals of the parallel impedances. A little bit of algebra gets us to the product of impedances over the sum of impedances form that works for two components. This product over sum only works for two components. If you try three, it will just make a mess. And some complex arithmetic results in an equivalent impedance of J400 ohms. This value may be slightly unexpected. Remember that in parallel combinations, the smaller resistance or impedance is going to dominate. The inductor has the smaller impedance, so that accounts for the fact that the equivalent impedance looks inductive. The impedance being larger than that of the original inductor has to do with having two different types of energy storage devices in parallel that are on the same order of magnitude. If the parallel impedances had closer absolute values, the equivalent impedance would have been larger, with the extreme being, if the impedances are matched, the equivalent impedance goes to infinity. It is a little harder to check your work when it comes to impedances and admittances, because some of the intuition that we develop for resistors is less useful. But we have to learn to trust our ability to take things step by step and do our computations correctly. Anyway, now we have a circuit with everything in series. The phasor voltage across the capacitor will be the same as the phasor voltage across the parallel combination. To determine the phasor voltage across the J400 ohm impedance, we have to write a fraction. With the impedance we want to know the voltage across over the sum of impedances in series and multiply that fraction by the voltage seen by the series combination. Performing the addition in the denominator results in a ratio of two complex numbers. All of the computations that need to be done are multiplications and divisions. We know that those are easier to do in polar form, so we should convert the numbers to polar form. If you need a reminder as to how to do the conversion, check the six minute mark of the complex number video. 
Once we have converted all of the numbers to polar form, we can multiply the magnitudes in the numerator and divide by the magnitude in the denominator to get the overall magnitude of 2. And then add the angles in the numerator and subtract the angle that is in the denominator to get a phase angle of 36.9 degrees. The phasor voltage is not our final answer. We have to convert the result back to the time domain. From polar form, recalling that the angular frequency was 5 mega radians per second, we can simply write the magnitude and the phase into the cosine function. So the voltage across the capacitor is 2 cosine 5 mega radians per second times time plus 36.9 degrees volts. There are a few more steps involved than when we have a circuit containing only resistors. But the circuit analysis is exactly the same. The extra steps mostly involve converting between the time and phasor domains and back again. Moving on, a current division will illustrate a couple more points. In this circuit, we have a resistor, a capacitor, and an inductor in parallel with a current source. That's an obvious setup for current division. For a goal, let's see if we can determine the time-dependent current through the inductor. To do this, we will use phasor analysis. The first wrinkle we might notice is that the source is given as a sine function. Before we convert to the phasor domain, we're going to have to convert that to a cosine function by subtracting 90 degrees from the argument. So then we have 50 cosine of 1000t minus 10 degrees milliamps. We should write the angular frequency off to the side so that we have it for calculations. Then we can start converting the circuit to the phasor domain. The time-dependent current, IL of T, can be written in phasor form as IL. The source is converted to the phasor domain by writing its magnitude E to the J times the phase angle. So we have 50 E to the minus J, 10 degrees milliamps. A resistance does not change when converting to the phasor domain. However, since we are going to perform a current division, it will be more convenient to work with admittances. The admittance of the 500 ohm resistor will be 2 millisiemens. The impedance of a capacitor is 1 over j omega c, so the admittance of the capacitor will be j times the angular frequency times the capacitance. This results in an admittance of j times 8 millisiemens. The impedance of an inductor is j omega l, so the admittance of the inductor is 1 over j times the angular frequency times the inductance. The admittance of the inductor is minus j 10 millisiemens. The circuit is converted now to the phasor domain, and now we can use current division to determine the current through the inductor. To determine the current through an admittance, when several admittances are in parallel with a known current, we take the admittance we are interested in, divided by the sum of admittances in parallel and multiply by the known current. If we do the arithmetic in the denominator, we have a ratio of admittances times the current. Since multiplication and division are more easily performed in polar form, let's convert the rectangular expressions to polar form. Again, if you need a reminder, check the six minute mark of the complex number video. With the numbers in polar form, we can multiply and divide the magnitudes as shown and add the angles in the numerator while subtracting the angle in the denominator. This results in an inductor current of 176.78 e to the minus j 55 degrees milliamps. All right, now we should be really upset. The answer we determine for the current through the inductor is larger than the current from the source. We know that cannot happen. Energy is always conserved. How is it possible to end up with more current at the output than we had at the input? It is not possible. So we have to go back and check our work. No matter how many times we go back and check our procedure and check our arithmetic, we are going to get the same exact answer. If our procedure is correct and our arithmetic is correct, either our science is wrong or we do not have the whole picture. The circuit law we are using to do current division is Kirchhoff's current law. According to Kirchhoff's current law, the current through the three passive components must be equal to the current from the source. Just a heads up, as I often do, I will play a little loosely with significant figures by carrying too many through the calculation. I find numeric proofs feel a little more convincing when more digits are carried through the calculations. I don't know why. I wonder if somebody's done a study on that. So we have the current through the inductor is 176.78 e to the minus j 55 milliamps. If we apply current division to solve for the current through the capacitor, we will get 141.43 e to the j 125 degrees milliamps. This is also larger than the current source. If we solve for the current through the inductor, we will get 35.36 e to the j 35 degrees milliamps. Finally, one that makes sense. In order to determine if Kirchhoff's current law is violated, we are going to add the 
three currents together. Remember, we cannot do addition of phasors in polar form, so we will have to convert them all over to rectangular form. The current through the inductor will become 101.39 minus J, 144.81 milliamps. The current through the capacitor will become minus 81.11 plus J, 115.85 milliamps. The current through the conductor will become 28.97 plus J, 20.28 milliamps. If we add these together, we get 49.241 minus J, 8.675 milliamps. If we convert this to polar notation, we will get 50E to the minus J, 10 degrees milliamps, which is exactly what our source was. So what is going on? When we have a system that has waves oscillating at the same frequency in it, but those waves do not match up in time, Sometimes they can constructively interfere to make peaks larger, and sometimes they can destructively interfere, which will decrease the peaks. So what we have here is some sort of constructive interference happening in the inductor and the capacitor. There is actually an exchange of energy between the capacitor and the inductor that is occurring where the stored energy is switching from electrical to magnetic energy back and forth, creating something like a ringing effect. In this circuit, the current through the inductor and the capacitor each are larger than the source. However, they are out of phase from each other so that their magnitudes cancel from the perspective of the source. In the end, conservation of charge, matter, and energy all hold. Later, in studying electrical engineering, we'll learn about resonance, which is an extreme of this. We can actually get close to a circuit where all the current through the source goes through the conductor, but there are still significant currents through the capacitor and inductor that cancel each other out because of the phase shifts. That was quite a rabbit trail. We still have to finish the problem we're working on. When we started this problem, we were looking for the time-dependent current through the inductor. We have the phasor current through the inductor, so we can convert that to the time domain fairly easily. Remembering the angular frequency of the source, we write the magnitude and the phase into the cosine function, giving us 176.8 cosine 1000 T minus 55 degrees milliamps. Current and voltage division have limited applicability, but this should still elucidate the point that the circuit analysis techniques developed for DC circuits still apply to sinusoidal steady state circuits. If you know how or can figure out how to solve systems of equations involving complex numbers, you can quickly learn how to use node voltage or mesh current analysis on circuits requiring phasors. The circuit analysis is exactly the same, only the algebra and arithmetic are slightly more involved. I have to emphasize that the phasor domain is not the time domain. Impedances do not apply to time domain signals, or DC signals for that matter. Phasor quantities cannot be analyzed at the same time as DC quantities. You cannot add a constant to a sinusoidal function and get a result with one term. AC analysis, DC analysis, and phasor analysis must all be done separately. If we are working on a circuit where mixed analysis is being done, solve each domain separately before using the principle of superposition to obtain an expression for the final result. It's been fun. Until next time, go out and make it a great one.